Hi everyone, welcome to this video in our series on critical media studies in which we'll be tackling psychoanalytic analysis, looking at the way the human psyche uh, affects the way that we create media and the way that we should view media through that, that particular critical lens. So let's jump in and see what we're talking about. First of all, psychoanalytic analysis examines artifacts using a framework of psychoanalysis, as you might imagine. Uh, this was primarily rooted in the theories of psychology and psychological development developed by Sigmund Freud and Jacques Lacan. Um, so we're going to discuss different aspects of psychoanalysis and then uh, get into psych psychoanalytic analysis. We're primarily going to focus in this video in our discussion on the work of Sigmund Freud, though. So let's uh, start off by taking a look at some Freudian basics. So uh, first of all, Freud said that behavior is driven by the unconscious, right? Driven by these things, and drive is a very important word here, that, the, that we all have these drives um, that exist beneath the level of our active consciousness, um, that, that these are things we're not necessarily fully aware of or always cognizant of, but these drives, um, these motivations, these things that propel us forward are there at all times uh, existing in our unconscious. So uh, these are largely developed, according to Freud, by our childhood events and a couple categories in general of things that happen in our childhood. First of all, our relationship with our parents. So not only our relationship, but then the relationship um, between our parents and the, and the relationship that we observe between our parents is important in psychoanalysis, that, that sort of power dynamic. And, uh, and what Freud would, would boil down to some sort of sexual uh, tension, sexual attraction, sexual, according to Freud, everything was driven by sex and death. So uh, this, this power dynamic that exists and this sort of sexual dynamic and sexual tension that exists between our parents and then between our parents and us and so forth. So, but, you know, big factor in our uh, adult uh, psychology and psychological makeup is our relationship with our parents. Also, our physiological fixations that develop in childhood. He had a couple of different categories, but um, so he, he focused a lot on um, anal fixation, phallic fixation, um, sometimes even oral fixation. But, and, you know, he would probably expand that definition to include things like fetishes, like, you know, foot fetishes and, and things like that, these physiological fixations that we have that, again, are really related to again, in Freudian theory, would be related to um, these sexual or death drives, one or the other, um, usually the, the sexual one predominant for those phys physiological fixations. But so these things happen in our childhood. We develop these fixations. We observe these relationships with our parents and the dynamics with our parents and their relationship. And then as a result, we develop these um, drives. And each each of us has a, a, develops a unique uh, makeup of drives, so to speak, again, this sexual drive and death drive um, that really um, uh, motivate us and, 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 def and form our, our psyche. So, um, so we, in order to um, work with that, then we, the, we have these defenses that are created to keep conflicts buried. So these, these, these tensions, these things arise in these drives that keep, um, uh, they, they keep creating conflicts right within us. Um, and a conflict, um, you know, or just these these tensions that exist within us that our psyche, uh, psyche our psyche is all constantly trying to find a balance between these things. So we develop these defenses to either um, repress or to let out these different uh, um, these different conflicts. So uh, the negative conflicts, though, we we tend to bury and we tend to repress through things like selective memory, selective perception, um, through denial, through projection, and then through fears that develop. And these fears, you know, various fears that we might have: fear of intimacy, fear of death, all these different things that might develop. These are all defenses, according to Freud, that uh, that de are developed in our psyche in order to keep those conflicts buried and repressed and keep them out of our conscious mind. We have three areas then, and so in addition to this, you know, behavior being driven by the unconscious, um, which is one significant aspect of, of Freudian theory, he also posited that there are three areas of our psyche that vie for dominance, and we're constantly um, working to, to balance or to, to manage these three areas that vie for dominance, and they are the id, the ego, and the superego. So the id, in essence, is the location of these drives that we talked about, the sex drive and the, the death drive. They're located in the id, and that really is our kind of a base animal instinct that that uh, really deals with and almost kind of gives into those things. The ego, then, is the location of those defenses that we mentioned, the, the selective memory and the fears and so forth are housed in the ego, um, which then combats what's going on in the id. So they're constantly in a battle, so to speak, 
The superego, then, is the location uh, of our judgment and our, our self-analysis, those types of things, and our, our, our self-assessment of others, judgment of, of ourselves and, and of others, um, is all located in the superego, kind of our higher moral plane, so to speak. Um, so if we think about it in, in you know, as using a, a, there's a lot of examples of this in The Simpsons, for example, where Homer's constantly at war. He's got the angel on one shoulder and the devil on the other, and he's stuck in the middle. So in that instance, sort of the the devil on the one shoulder would be the um, id driving those base uh, drives, then, you know, motivations. Um, Homer himself would be the ego trying to find ways to uh, combat those things or really you know, to manage those things and, and develop defenses there. And then the angel on the other would be the superego, what we call the superego. Or if you want to put it in different terms, according to the Simpsons, Bart would be an example of the id just to pursuing whatever um, you know, fancy takes his uh, attention at that moment. Uh, Homer sort of acts as the ego and the conflict between that and trying to, to manage those um, conflicts, I guess. And then at least is more the super ego, the, you know, the kind of the better soul, so to speak, and, 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 and the moral compass of the family. So, uh, but Freud would say that all three of these things vie for dominance within us. They're all trying to take over and they're all just so, so really we're stuck in the middle of trying to balance these three things, trying to manage these th three things. And uh, again, Freud would say all of this develops in childhood. All of this is really pretty much developed in childhood through those um, various uh, factors. Uh, but, but then they uh, influence our adult behaviors then as well. They carry over through the unconscious into our adult behaviors and that these things are really what Again, the drive and motivate us, and and uh, for for better or for worse, uh, even as adults, that these are the things that uh, that keep us, um, uh, that keep coming up in our psyche, again without even realizing it. So, yeah. okay, so that's our basics of Freud. That's an, uh, those are really gross oversimplifications. <laughs> I apologize if you're a psychology. A major or a psychologist watching this and you're like, well, that's that's way too simple. Way too, yeah, I understand. We just want to get the basic framework of Freudian uh, analysis here and psychoanalysis so that we can talk about it in the context of uh, of media and critical media studies. So with that in mind, the major premises then of um, psychoanalytic analysis as it relates to critical media studies uh, are these. First of all, again, as, as Freud pointed out, the that our uh, unconscious childhood conflicts will influence those adult behaviors. And as adults, then we create media. I mean, adults typically are the ones who are creating media. So um, that, that um, those unconscious uh, conflicts then are going to impact our adult behaviors. And as a result, that shows through in what we create. Right? So again, as we create media, we are influenced by those things that really drive us, that really motivate us, that really propel us, uh, and that, that develop as a result of those uh, conflicts from childhood, so to speak, right? that, that develop in our psyche as, as, as a part of those conflicts. And then uh, we recognize um, those psychological attributes in psychoanalytic analysis. We're recognizing those psychological attributes of the creator, the audience, and the examiner that offer insight into that artifact. We recognize that they can do so. Right, that there is a a psychological uh, impact or influence from the creator, whoever created this media, or with the person or persons or organization that created this media, whatever was driving them psychologically. Also, the drive of the audience in why they're interested in this media and how they're going to view that media. You know, what's the appeal there for them? And then the examiner. We bring our own, uh, you know, psychological. Uh, um, unconscious um, conflicts and behaviors and things that, from our own childhood and so forth that we as examiners then, or as people who are analyzing this, need to recognize that in ourselves as well, right? So uh, it really influences every aspect of media creation, media consumption, and media examination. Then. So we're recognizing those psychological attributes. So some common questions that we that we come across in psychoanalytic analysis, and again, let me let me point out that as in all these videos, these are just a few. This is just a handful of questions that give you an idea of the types of things that you might ask as part of this analysis. This is by no means a comprehensive list, and not intended to in any way um, indicate that it is. But these are just some common questions that you see when people engage in psychological analysis or psychoanalytic analysis of media. So first, how do the operations of repression structure um, inform that work? 
So when we talked about in, you know, earlier on, we talked about um, um, the, the conflicts that exist, that, that Freud would say exist, how, and, the, and then they are repressed. Right? They are repressed through um, those different um, management um, 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 operations, I guess, uh, for, for lack of a better word, uh, that uh, that exist in the ego. They're tr we try and manage those. Through. So that, that creates that repression. So how do these operations of repression structure or inform the work? In other words, what are the predominant um, psycho, um, um, psychological um, factors that are really uh, at work here, either from the creator or from the audience or the examiner and so forth, um, those types of things. So what are the, what are the dominant uh, operations of repression here? Uh, in addition, we can ask uh, what Oedipal or other family dynamics are present. Like the Oedipus complex is this uh, concept that Freud came up with that has to do with children, especially male children, wanting to uh, having a, a sexual fascination with their fascination with their mother, and fantasization, I guess, but with their mother, um, either because of the, the the protection idea or the, the idea that they feel sorry for them for being um, less than their father because of the a, a phallic obsession or so forth. They, all kinds of reasons. But anyway, it's, and it's named after the, the, the famous play Oed the Oedipus, where, where Oedipus was um, uh, obsessed with his mother, so to speak. And um, so anyway, what Oedipal or other family dynamics, again, we talked about your relationship with your parents being so critical in psychoanalytic um, uh, the psychoanalytic process that uh, um, what what are those family dynamics are present in that work? How can the character's behavior, narrative events, or images that are that are used in that uh, particular media, depending on the media artifact type, like how can those be explained in terms of psychoanalytic concepts of any kind? And by that we mean you know psychoanalytic concepts meaning a uh, fear or fascination with death or sexuality, which would include sexuality. By the way, includes love and romance as well as a you know explicit physical sexual behavior it would include love and romance as well that is you know sexuality as a primary indicator of psychological identity or are those uh, uh, is that a, a primary indicator of, of psychological identity for that for that person uh, or the operations of the ego id super ego those are all different types of psychoanalytic concepts that one might use to examine and a framework that one might use to examine uh, a media artifact. So how can the character's behaviors be explained in the terms of one or more of those, uh, of, of those items? What does the work suggest about the psychological being of its author? So again, looking specifically at the person who created or the, the persons who created that, what does this work suggest about their psychological being? And what we can uh, sort of uh, presume or, or make inference about their um, um, psychological being, what drives them, in other words, what motivations do they have, what are their unconscious psychological um, behaviors there. Uh, what might a given interpretation of an artifact suggest about the psychological motives of the examiner? So again, we're going to look not only at the creator, not only at the audience, but the examiner, how does my interpretation of this artifact or how does my assessment of this um, artifact, if at all, does it reveal anything about my own psychological motives or my own particular uh, repressions or conflicts or, or things like that? Uh, are there prominent words or images present that could have different or hidden meanings? Again, uh, symbology is very important in Freudian analysis when you look at his work on dreams and, and so forth. Um, the, the symbology is, is a central aspect of that. And so are there uh, symbols here that really represent other things? As we've talked about with symbols, they may represent uh, other things. Sometimes that, that, uh, that uh, meaning is, is clearer than others, and sometimes there's a double meaning and so forth. But so what are the meanings or hidden messages and why these, why were these uh, uh, symbols chosen? Almost a form of, of rhetorical analysis hidden within um, psychoanalytic analysis here. And then could there be a subconscious reason for the author using these quote unquote problem words or problem images, these, these images or symbols that have different meanings? Uh, is there a subconscious reason that the author might be using those things instead of maybe a more direct or, or uh, a symbol or, or word in its, uh, in its stead? So, so in order to just kind of work through some of these questions, explain some of these questions a little bit, I, I picked a, a song a little while ago that I think is, is appropriate and it's fun, it's popular a little while ago that, um, that I'd like to just 
perform a brief psychoanalytic analysis on, on uh, this particular song in this particular video um, that, I, that, I, that I chose. It was very popular a little while ago, but um, I chose Watermelon Sugar by Harry Styles. You may be familiar with that. If not, go, go ahead and listen to the song or watch the video, and, uh, and you, can, you can see whether or not you agree with my own little analysis here. But just working through those questions real quickly uh, for Watermelon Sugar, uh, how do the operations of repression structure or inform the work? Well, I would see obviously sexuality has is very prominent in this, not only the song, but especially in the video. If you watch the music video, um, sexuality is very prominent uh, in every part of that song and, and really uh, just um, is hard to get away from in, in that song. And, and especially given what people suspect and what Styles has since confirmed is the sort of hidden meaning, but we'll get to that. But, you know, uh, the, the lyrics, the instrumentation, the imagery in the video and the promotion of this song, kind of the mystery behind the meaning of the, the, the title lyrics and things, Watermelon Sugar, um, just all of that relates back to sexuality, this kind of idea of repressed sexuality, but but not explicit, right? He's not explicitly saying what he's implying with the song, so it's sort of a repressed um, feel in that, in that regard. So, um, what Oedipal or other family dynamics are present? Um, here, I, I would say you know, just on the surface, the aspect of, of pleasing a maternal figure um, or you know, trying to, to please, in his instance, a, a maternal figure or you know, a, um, um, so perhaps even maybe some guilt for um, paternal or uh, patriarchal dominance in the idea of of trying to please that maternal figure, um, whether that's because he wants to be um, uh, seen as as um, uh, as as a you know good boy, so to speak, because he's pleasing in that way, or if he's um, maybe expressing some guilt over some lingering um, patriarchal dominance uh, and, and trying to say, well, I'm sorry for all that, so let me you know uh, accommodate by doing this other thing instead and and, and uh, offering some pleasure in that sense. So, um, <clears throat> but I think it's possible to see some at a Oedipal and other family dynamics uh, that are present here. Uh, how can characters' behavior, narrative events, and or images be explained in terms of psychoanalytic concepts of any kind? Well, there's certainly a level of fantasy at work here, um, which is another aspect of this. There's, there's, a, there's a level of uh, a fantasy playing out not only in the in the music video, but in the in the song itself. And this idea of um, again, what does it what does it really mean? What is what is you know, and, and it playing out a fantasy in that regard. Um, the superego is sort of implied, I think, with euphemism or substitution of the words, possibly. Um, so again, watermelon sugar is is euphemistic, is a substitution of words for something else that he's you know that he's implying, but not saying outright. And that could perhaps be because his superego is stepping in and saying, "Look, we can't say this outright." Uh, and it could just be a, he wanted the song to be played on the radio, and he could it wouldn't be if he said, this, said what he was thinking out loud anyway. But so he had to use a euphemism in that way. But it could also be that his superego is saying, "Look, I can't say this out loud. I'm I'm a little you know repressed about this. So um, so let me say this other thing instead, and everybody will just know what I mean." So there's there's a possibility of those types of uh, those you know the fantasy at work there the super ego in play with with substituting those words things like that that you could possibly um, see in this work. What does the work suggest about the psychological being uh, of its author? I would say in part you know, again if we step back into Freud, Freud was all about sex and death. And I would say certainly this is uh, this piece is representative of maybe a drive of being driven by sexuality and a desire to please. Uh, maybe to even be seen as helpful or selfless in that regard, um, given the, the again the, the the context of the song, you know, and what what the song is 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 really about um, the the the, uh, the the effort to to be seen as again helpful or selfless and giving to the other person this desire to please, um, but also wrapped up in this idea of sexuality based on on Freud's. Um, uh, work uh, certainly uh, would be present there as well. What might a given interpretation of an artifact, uh, or this artifact in particular, suggest about the psychological motives of the examiner? Um, I, you know, maybe a, a, a for, so for the examiner being me, um, it maybe that uh, that there's a more repressed or buttoned up uh, view of sexuality in a public sense. I guess that uh, um, the, the idea that uh, this is not something that I would probably sing about, or you know, reference based on my 
upbringing, my psyche, my whatever, um, that, uh, that I'm probably a little more repressed or buttoned up in terms of my view of sexuality in a public sense and a public discussion sense um, than, than Harry Styles is. That probably won't surprise too many people that know me, though. Are there prominent words in the piece that could have a different or hidden meaning? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think it's safe to say that there are there are words or images here in the piece that have uh, a hidden meaning, not very well hidden apparently, but a hidden meaning. The title, um, first of all, watermelon sugar, again, apparently is representative of um, uh, pleasing a, a a woman in his sense, in, in his definition, and in, in uh, Harry Styles's definition. Yes, it's a it's a reference to um, providing oral sex to a woman and you know, pleasing her in that way. So. Um, and, and so the title has a hidden meaning. There's lots of skin in the video um, and lots of, you know, young, good looking people in the video. There's prominent placement of the watermelon on the table, which is, you know, seemingly a reference uh, as well to, to, you know, that type of thing. So uh, and again, here we could go back to my own repressed or button up view of sexuality in a public sense uh, of discussing this publicly. But I think it's an excellent representation of psychoanalytic analysis. But uh, but still, yeah, you can see my own uh, more traditional con conservative uh, upbringing and, and psychological makeup coming through even in just discussing this, I guess. So uh, could there be some conscious reason for the author using these problem words or or images and, and substituting them, I guess? Yeah. So, I mean, it can, part of it could be that he's seeking acceptance from a broader audience. And uh, so, you know, he doesn't want to say the thing, but he still wants acceptance. Uh, so he's, he's saying what he wants to say without actually saying it. Or it could be that he's still, you know, Harry Styles was a member of One Direction. May surprise you to know that I know that. Um, but, you know, we, do have young, we did have young kids at that time, so they were interested in One Direction. And it could still be, though, that he's trying to hold on to that younger fan base um, from One Direction with that euphemism, that if he came out and was too sexually explicit, that it might you know, put in danger his ability to appeal to that younger audience. And, and so it could be that, uh, that he's using, uh, the, substituting the words watermelon sugar uh, to try and hold on to that younger fan base, which would, again, come back to sort of this acceptance, this uh, uh, desire to, to please or to um, uh, please a broader audience and be accepted by a broader audience. Okay. Enough of that. That was just a silly little uh, uh, examination of one artifact that I think lends itself well to this type of thing. So um, I hope that this has been helpful for you in understanding psychoanalytic analysis, that you have a basis now um, for what Freud's work was about and then how that impacts how we go about viewing media in a critical sense. Again, this is just one of the lenses, one of the many lenses that we can use in examining um, these uh, these um, critical um, frameworks in, in media. And so I hope that you will put it to use uh, as well as the other um, lenses that we've discussed in this series and we'll continue to discuss in this series. If you have questions about this or anything else related to uh, critical media studies, I certainly hope that you'll shoot me an email. I'd love to discuss it with you uh, in that way. And in the meantime, I hope you'll get out there and take a new view and a new critical uh, lens with you as you continue to examine uh, media in a critical sense. <laughs>